Welcome to Grand Valley Homecoming Week. Hope some of you are participating in those activities. Uh, today is our first Sekia breakfast for uh, this academic year. Uh, thank you to Joan and Peter for supporting this for so many years and allowing us to bring in speakers like we have today. Um, before I introduce our moderator, I might add that we have a uh, Seedman Social tomorrow night. Uh, that's at Founders, and we're going to be interviewing J.D. Lokes about the uh, trends in the entertainment district and what's going on uh, downtown and so on. So any of you that are interested in that. Um, as a, a board president of Seedman Alumni Association and also an adjunct faculty, I love all the students we have here. Could all the students raise your hand for a second so we can... Wow, that's great. I didn't bribe mine this semester that they got extra credit, so my students that are here uh, came because they were interested, so that's good. Uh, today, Keith Brophy is our uh, Brophy. I always tease him with a last name like Brophy, and I'm Smith. That's a little challenging. Uh, Keith and I have been friends for a uh, number of years. He is our uh, local IT tech prognosticator for West Michigan, and so we're really happy to have him back. Uh, he's our moderator today. Uh, he's a technology business builder, innovator. He's currently director of a newly launched business lab initiative at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan Emerging Markets. So that, that's a pretty interesting new uh, uh, move. Uh, Keith formerly was the state director of the Michigan Small De Business Development Center. He was CEO of IDEOMED. He was uh, CEO and co-founder of SageStone. And he was uh, past West Michigan Entrepreneur of the Year uh, recipient. So, uh, and Keith's got a lot of other pursuits that uh, it's not about him today. So, I'm going to invite him up here and he can introduce who it's really about. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate the intro and I'm very excited to be our moderator for this morning's program. But before we begin, uh, I'd like to acknowledge some special businesses among us this morning. Michigan celebrates small business, the premier small business awards program, recently recognized Michigan's 50 companies to watch. The list included a number of West Michigan companies, and we'd like to raise your awareness of their success. To those honorees with us, I would like to ask you to please stand as I call your name and remain standing. Uh, please hold your applause for this fine group until the end of the list. So, our awardees in the 50 to watch from West Michigan, Simplicity Communications, Tracy Price and Bill Osborne. Green Gifts, Karen and Lou Scarpino. Terra Discovery Partners, Inc., Mark Gurney and Chad Coberly. Sprinkles Donut Shop, LLC, Gary Vanderstelt. Grow, Jill May, and Voices for Health, Carlos Pava. Please join me in a round of applause for West Michigan's finest. When we wrap today, I suggest taking a minute and tracking down one of these businesses and asking them about their secrets to success. Also keep in mind that the Michigan Celebrates Awards are an annual event organized by the SBDC. If you know a small business that you think might be a good candidate for next year's award, there's a card right on your table. It looks like this, and it will provide information about the nomination process. And now, as a longtime technologist, it is with much excitement that I introduce to you our main speaker for this morning, the Chief Information Officer at SWITCH, Missy Young. Since 2005, Missy has played a critical role in the company's evolution, is the most innovative data center company in the world, and the world's only hyperscale retail co-location ecosystem. The SWITCH Pyramid, right here in West Michigan, is the largest data center in the eastern portion of the United States. SWITCH has an incredible company culture, and it includes an executive roster that is over 50% female and an overall team that consists of over 70% veterans. In addition to her role in building this success, Missy also has a great heart 
for numerous causes, especially advocacy for students in technology. Missy is a champion for the organization Girls Who Code, which is focused on closing the gender gap in technology. She's also a supporter of FIRST Robotics and a national leader in STEAM, or science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics educational initiatives. Just last week, she lent her expertise to a STEAM panel here in Grand Rapids as part of Art Prize. Today, Missy is going to talk about another one of her passions in a subject that will impact all of our lives, artificial intelligence. She brings her own expert and unique twist to this topic as she steps us through her presentation, Artificial Intelligence, Keeping the Human in Humanity. As time permits, we will follow up her remarks with question and answers. Missy, welcome to Seedman in Grand Valley, and please take the stage and point us to the future. So let me get my notes, which are on my iPad. So I learned a while back when I had to testify in front of the legislature at the state of Nevada, a very important lesson. So we were there in support of a bill that the governor was pushing forward, and I stepped up to testify. And of course, I don't bring notes on paper because I'm the tech representative, so who prints things anymore? So I have my notes on my iPad, and I'm sitting there talking in front of live television cameras, and everyone's watching. and. Pretty much everyone I'd ever known decided that was the perfect time to text me and tweet at me and instant message me saying, oh my gosh, you're on TV. <laughs> and, I, and so all of these messages are popping up on my iPad as I'm trying to use my notes for my speech. So the lesson is, if you have to give a speech, use airplane mode <laughs> on your iPad, OK? You've been warned. You're welcome. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is how technology is really going to impact our lives going forward. And there are some very interesting questions that we are all going to need to answer, especially all of you students in the room whose jobs it will be going forward to solve these challenges for the rest of us as we age out. Not that I plan on aging out anytime soon. Don't get excited. Um, but so. If you look up here, we'll kind of look at what happens in an internet minute. And some of these can be a little hard to read from wherever it is you're sitting. But all of the numbers are going up. All of us are using technology more and more and more. And one of the interesting things to note is that Netflix, uh, last year in an internet minute in 2017, there were seven, over 70,000 hours watched per minute. I don't know how they can calculate hours watched per minute. but. Uh, in 2018, it's estimated 266,000 hours per minute of Netflix being watched. So think about that massive jump. I don't know how many of you watch series on Netflix or Hulu or any of those things, but that's where, that's where we're headed. And so if I was a uh, TV cable company, that, that little data point there would have me a little bit worried, right, as far as all the people who are cutting the cord with cable and switching just to watching Netflix and HBO and things like that on their iPads and, and mobile devices. Uh, another interesting statistic that I like is the fact that last year we sent about 15,000 GIFs per minute. GIFs are those little animated videos that you can send via text. And so this year it's estimated we're up to 25,000 GIFs sent per minute. And so I've had, I don't know about you guys, I've had entire conversations with my friends just using GIFs. Like you can absolutely express practically anything you want to express just using these little videos in your text. It's totally awesome. But so uh, if you haven't started using that yet, you will. And so uh, what this really illustrates is that our usage of data, our usage of the internet and technology is not going away. I mean, how many of you have trouble putting down your iPhones or your iPads and have potentially been, you know, talk to by family members about your inability to concentrate on what they're saying versus whatever it is you're looking at on your phone. And so, and I'm sure all of us have had those conversations with our kids. And so, uh, so this is not going away. And it's actually really staggering how much this is not going away. And so the percentage of the world's data that was created in the last two years, anybody have a guess? 90% of the world's data was created in just the last two years alone. OK, so we are creating data at a skyrocketing exponential rate. I mean, there, this is just not going away. And how many of you have a mobile phone? If you're not raising your hands, you're lying. <laughs> OK. So what's really interesting is that mobile phones today, just your iPhone, has more technology in it than was used to send the astronauts to the moon and back. 
Okay, if somebody said, we're going to send you to the moon on a rocket powered by your iPhone, would you go? But those guys did, total cowboys. I mean, that's amazing. But if you look at, uh, if you ever watched that movie, Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks, remember at the end they were just looking for four extra watts? Just four watts. I don't have a single server in any of our data centers that only uses four watts. You know, that's how much power all of these machines are consuming. And so, how many devices will be connected to the internet by 2020? Anybody have a guess? 50 billion. 50 billion, so you're a little off, but it was a good guess. Um, so connected to the internet, if we think about devices, most of us think that that's our phone, our iPad, our computer, right? But one of the things you have to think about is that as we march towards the internet of things, things are going to be connected to the internet. Okay, things like your Keurig coffee maker, reporting back to the Keurig mothership about how much coffee you drink and what kind you like and how often the filter has to be changed and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's some interesting data that's being collected as these devices get smart, okay? Your dishwasher is going to be connected to the internet. Uh, think about a Fitbit, okay? Anybody here have a Fitbit? Okay, a Fitbit by itself doesn't use a lot of connectivity, but 100 million Fitbits do, and 100 million Keurigs do. And so think about the connectivity needs that are gonna need to go up at your home and at all of our businesses. And so these are the challenges that we are all going to face. And so this is a new reality for all of us as we look at how artificial intelligence is going to handle all of this data. Because just because we're creating all the data, well, what do we do with it? How do we analyze all of this data going forward? And so if you think about you know, 100 million Keurigs all collecting data, there's no way that any human is gonna to want to sit around and just sort through that and try to make sense of it. It's going to take artificial intelligence engines to look at all of this data and glean information. Data does not have value until someone or something turns it into information. And so that's really what this is all about. And so if you look at uh, eBay, one of our clients uh, out in Nevada, they have never deleted anything, ever. Since the day they started the company, they've been collecting data on all of their auctions. And so they have all the auctions of all the, of all the, all the archives of all the auctions they've ever run sitting in a massive uh, storage array in Las Vegas. And so just to give you an idea of how much data that is, the Library of Congress estimates that the entire written works of man from the dawn of time until today in every language combined is about 50 petabytes of data. Just eBay's archives alone, that's 100 petabytes of data. Twice the written works of man from the dawn of time until today. That's only one company. I mean, I don't know what companies you guys work for, but how, many, how much data does every one of your companies have? And so why doesn't eBay delete all that stuff? Because all the physical devices that it takes them to run all the archives, it's about a billion dollars worth of hardware. And so a lot of people have said, they should just delete that. Why spend all the money on storing the archives? Well, here's why. All of that data has value if they can turn it into information. Every brand in the world wants to know what eBay knows about their brand. Toyota knows what happened to the car the first time it sold, but eBay can potentially tell them what happened to that car the second and third time it was sold. The company Tiffany, the jeweler, will call eBay and say, hey, eBay, what are people collecting of our older designs? You know, maybe we'll incorporate some of that back into a new collection. And so for a fee, eBay's massive analytics engine can go and crunch all the raw data in the archives and come back with useful information for Tiffany. And so data is valuable. So let's look at how is this going to impact us on a few different uh, fields. So health and humanity. Anyone in here ever have an MRI? Anybody? Okay. So what happens when you get an MRI? Your doctor and your radiologist will look at your MRI and compare that against every MRI that he or she has ever seen that's residing in the memories of, the, of that person's brain and compare it and contrast it with what that person has learned, that doctor or that radiologist. But what if, when you get an MRI, it could be uploaded into an artificial intelligence engine that could compare it against two million MRIs of the exact same thing? and say, well, for a man you know, between 60 and 70 uh, in this area of the country, this is what the typical diagnosis was and this was the best source of treatment. It makes, it makes diagnosis more accurate, it makes treatment more effective, and the insurance companies are certainly a fan of all of those things. So that you're not misdiagnosed and mistreated from the start. But so it makes our ability to potentially diagnose these things more effective if artificial intelligence can scan millions of MRIs of the exact same thing you're in there for versus just what your doctor has in his or her brain. So uh, also, how are we going to feed all the people 
that are being born on this planet. By the year 2050, the population is estimated to be just under 10 billion people. And so how, how is the surface of the Earth going to grow enough food to handle that? And so the only way to do that is to do vertical farming. So there's a really cool company called The Bowery that is doing vertical farming in an industrial warehouse in New Jersey, in a place where you would never think farming could exist. But inside this massive warehouse, they have rows and rows and rows vertically of plants that they are growing. They're growing food in a warehouse and using what is really just a small patch of land, but growing it vertically into the sky using thousands of sensors and computers to analyze the sensors and then robots to plant and grow and maintain all of this food that is being grown in this industrial warehouse. And so that's really the only way we're going to be able to feed all of the people in the world is by this industrial uh, farming initiative. And so it's gonna take a lot of technology and a lot of robotics. And so uh, recently in Singapore, a friend of mine ordered room service in his hotel room and the food was delivered by a robot. Has anybody had food delivered by a robot before in your hotel room? Well, we're starting to do that now in Las Vegas. And he was so surprised when the robot showed up at the door, he took the food from the robot and just stood there and watched it roll away down the hall and get on the elevator, <laughs> you know, because he wasn't prepared. And so we've had in Vegas, a, a couple of hotels start to uh, try this in theirs and it's working out really well, but a lot of people have become upset saying, hey, that robot took a person's job. And I said, yeah, but think about all the jobs for the people who design, maintain, operate and, and repair that robot. That's the future. That's where we should be training our kids is in STEAM initiatives, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. We're very passionate about keeping the arts in STEM because without the arts, STEM has no soul. We have to make sure that we are designing things with a form that is, that is pleasing to us as humans. Otherwise, nobody's going to want to use it. And so that's one of the reasons why arts is so important, but it also makes sure that people are critical thinkers and that they are creative thinkers. And so that's why we're huge supporters of Art Prize here in Michigan. So let's also look at travel and automation. Has anyone ridden in an autonomous vehicle yet? I did. It's scary. <laughs> there, was, there was actually a human behind the wheel. Still scary. Uh, so this all does potentially have great benefit for all of us. Why? Because if all the cars on the road are automated and all the computers can interact together and make decisions together, it's safer. Because a robot or a machine or a computer is not going to fall asleep at the wheel. It's not going to be distracted by a text. It's not going to drive while intoxicated. And so all of these things mean that we will be safer on the road. However, it also means that every one of us has to give up our right to drive. And I don't know about you, I love my car. I worked hard for that car. I, I really enjoy driving that car. I may have gotten a couple tickets, but that's not the point. The point is, this is something that all of us in this room have grown up being able to do. Now, a lot of people who live in urban areas have already given up their cars. They either ride the subway or they take Uber or Lyft or they use whatever method of transportation, but a lot of people in, in very urban areas, they don't even own cars anymore. So it's not as uncommon as you might think. And if you're riding on a subway or a train or anything, you are riding in an autonomous vehicle, right? That's really what that is. But so all of these vehicles, all of these autonomous cars are creating massive amounts of data. Uh, right now, the test vehicles for autonomous, uh, autonomous initiatives are creating a gigabyte of data per second and so what that means in it is four and a half minutes that the, it, one vehicle has created more data than I can store on my iPhone in just four and a half minutes. So think about all of this data that's being created. And so all of this data has to be stored somewhere and then it has to be constantly analyzed because they're analyzing all the data to see, well, how often are cars crashing? Where are the computers making mistakes? Okay, we have to rewrite that programming in order to fix all of those things. All of that data really matters because as we analyze it and figure all this out, that's what's going to make us safer on the roads if we're going to use autonomous vehicles. And so where does all this live? Well, a lot of it lives at switch. And so all of these machines have to run somewhere. And I'm sure you guys have heard of the cloud. The cloud is not some ethereal, <laughs> fluffy, you know, white thing that looks like cotton balls. It actually looks like this. And so uh, these are actually some of eBay's racks. And so very, very, very high density. Um, just one of the, those vertical columns that you see in the picture there runs more power than about 50 homes in just one of those little spaces. And so uh, all of the machines need a ton of power. They all have to be in some place that isn't going to be affected by a natural disaster, right? Because uh, Hurricane Sandy illustrated that for quite a few of our clients who were on the East Coast of uh, the, the potential uh, loss that they experienced. Uh, companies that have had outages, have had downtimes in their data center, have, have experienced hundreds of millions of dollars in losses because they had downtime. 
Uh, you know, if I go onto a website to shop and I can't click on the thing that I want to buy because their website went down, guess what? I'm going to go shop somewhere else. And I'm going to remember that that, one, that website wasn't there when I needed it. How many of you have been at the same bank for over 10 years? Yeah, a lot of us. And so your bank may have done an amazing job taking care of you and they've earned your trust and they've earned your loyalty, but that one day comes when you need to log in and move money from here to there. It's critical, it's super important. You go to do that and the website's down. It's estimated that within seven seconds you will start thinking about changing banks because you are inconvenienced online. Okay, this is how spoiled we've all become. Not that long ago, you young students might not remember this, but we had to actually get in the car and drive to the bank and walk inside and wait in line and a manager would come maybe stamp it and maybe had to get somebody to approve it and three to five days later it would post to your account. That was the norm. That was really how we did it. Now if we can't do what we want online in seven seconds, we're mad. And, and I'm guilty of this too. I was shopping online for Christmas last year and I went to pay for, pay for something on a website and discovered that they didn't take PayPal. So I was like, oh, I have to go downstairs to get my credit card out of my purse. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, I just shopped in my pajamas from the comfort of my own home and I'm mad because I gotta go down the stairs to get my credit card. But that's how we've all become. We've all become so involved in this convenience aspect of our lives. Do you guys have Instacart here in Grand Rapids yet? Instacart may potentially be the best thing since sliced bread. You can choose Whole Foods or Smith's or Albertsons or whatever grocery store you want and, and put in all the things that you want and they will deliver it to your home. No need to go to the grocery store. It's the best thing ever. So when you're sick or you know whatever and you don't want to go to the grocery store, you don't have to. They'll bring it right to you. And so this is, this is what all of this data is creating for us is convenience. It's making it so that we spend less time doing the things that are inconvenient and more time doing the things that we want. Like riding in autonomous vehicles. Oh wait, that's right, you guys aren't gonna do that, right? But so if you're going to power all of these machines, are you going to ruin the planet with carbon and all of these other things? And so how do you be sustainable when you're trying to run all of these massive computers? And so Switch has made a huge commitment to sustainability. And so all of our facilities are powered by 100% clean and renewable energy. We were actually named the number one sustainable technology company in the world by Greenpeace last year. So we beat Apple, Facebook, Google, everybody because of our commitment to sustainability. We are firm believers that even though data runs the planet, it shouldn't ruin the planet. There's really no reason why the entire internet cannot be powered sustainably if we all choose to make that our goal. And so we've definitely demonstrated how that can be done. And so sustainability is very important to all of our customers as well. Companies like eBay and Hulu and Disney and Sony, they all have to be able to show their customers and their investors what their commitment to sustainability is. So they're happily using all of this 100% clean renewable energy at Switch. And so, how do you connect it? All of these things have to be connected to the internet. As we talked about the internet of things, all of those devices, as they are getting connected, more, they are going to start consuming more and more and more bandwidth. You guys remember those commercials about the internet hog? You know, all of these devices are gonna start hogging all of your internet at your house. Unless all of the telecommunications companies start beefing up all of that infrastructure. And so you're going to see also a massive increase in builds of connectivity. And as 5G comes on board, 5G is going to make that a lot easier, but there's also a huge amount of reworking of the infrastructure that will be needed to support 5G. So you could potentially see price increases there. And so data can teach us a lot about ourselves. Data can teach us how we buy things, how we get diagnosed, how we can treat people better, how we can grow more food. It can teach us all kinds of things, but one thing that data can't potentially teach us is compassion, empathy, the things that make humans human. You know, how do we make sure that as we continue to march forward into this amazing future of AI and Internet of Things and machine learning and quantum computing, um, what about the empathy part of it, right? How do you teach a robot to have compassion? And whose compassion? Is it my compassion? Is it Kim Jong-un's compassion? Right, there's different types of compassion out there. And so who's teaching the robots, right? Because you can teach robots a lot of things, but can we teach it compassion? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, there's been yeah. a great example of this if you guys watched you Big Hero 6. So Baymax is a robot. And one of the great things about Baymax is that he reflects the compassion of his designer. Uh, Tadashi, who had passed away. And so when he says Tadashi is here, he really means Tadashi is in my programming. 
because Tadashi programmed the robot to have the same kind of compassion that he would have as a as a human. And so these are the these are the challenges that we face going forward. How do we teach AI to act like a human? How is it going to reflect the designer? But who is moderating the designer? Again, if you know, these tools are incredible. A moving van can be a great tool to help you move, right? But it can also be an instrument of death in a crowded street. And so as we create all of these tools, I am not a naysayer. I am a, hey, this can really improve our lives on multiple levels. But it's going to require a massive amount of oversight from all of us to make sure that in our race to become technologically advanced, we don't forget the best part of what makes us all human. And so the, uh, Arthur C. Clarke said, the one fact about the future of which we can be certain is that it will be utterly fantastic. I would say that it could be utterly fantastic, but it's going to take a lot of, you know, less fear of missing out. Okay, we gotta get AI, we gotta get AI, and more thoughtful consideration of how are we designing these things. Uh, one of the interesting companies that we work with is a company called Machine Zone. And you've probably never heard of Machine Zone, but they make games on your mobile phone like Game of War and Mobile Strike. You guys might have seen the commercials with Arnold Schwarzenegger in the battle scenes. You know, they paid Arnold Schwarzenegger $15 million to appear in their commercials. And they can afford it because they make $2 million a day per game just on those little extra things you guys can buy when you're playing it. And so the founder of Machine Zone, this guy Gabe, he's kind of young guy, I said, what did you do before you were CEO of Machine Zone? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I, I don't know how to rephrase that question. <laughs> um, it's kind of clear. Uh, and he said, oh, well, I've always written code. And you know, in college, I was making my own games back then. And I would ask my friends to play the games. And then based on their feedback, I would change the code to adapt to what they liked and didn't like. But after a while, I got tired of doing that. So I wrote the code so that it could change itself. And so the game knows, based on the way you play, if you go into a cave and find a treasure chest and open it up, you're more likely to buy the magic sword than the bag of gems. And so it will show you the magic sword just to get that extra dollar out of you. But it does it 400 million times a day. <laughs> and so the game learns about you and what you like in order to get that extra dollar, get that extra dollar, get that extra dollar. And so these are, the, these are the things that data can teach us about ourselves, but what are we going to teach AI about us? And so these are very important questions, especially for the students in here, as you go forward into your careers of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Uh, every single company out there is a tech company. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. Every single tech company out there uses computers in some way, shape, or form. Every single company out there has technology that is critical to its continuing existence. And so this is going to become very important to all of us as we go forward. And so uh, these are not questions to which I have the answers, but hopefully we can all solve them together. Thank you. Seat, Missy. Sure. Thank you, Missy, for those fascinating remarks. Sure. Uh, that's very interesting and inspiring. <laughs> and now we'd like to pose a few questions to you. Okay. I'll start us out with a couple, then we'll take some from the audience as well. Okay. You bring such an interesting and informed outlook on artificial intelligence. And I wanted to get your opinion on where it ultimately takes humanity. Over the last year or so, Elon Musk, the CEO, former chairman of Tesla, uh, shared the perspective that AI would ultimately be evil. He even urged governments to take uh, proactive action to protect us. And then Facebook founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg weighed in with a counter opinion. He said, no, AI can ultimately uplift humanity. It's for the good of us. Uh, it will ultimately be a good thing. Are they both right? Uh, they both could be right. How's that? And, and I'm not sure how, how much weight I'm going to put on Elon's opinion right now, but um, just saying. Uh, so it's, it's just like um, hacking, right? The hacking can be used for good or for evil. And so hackers have caused untold amounts of damage to companies and to humans uh, on, on numerous levels. And we've all heard about that in the news. But uh, there's actually a, a certification out there for uh, people who know how to, how to use it called Certified Ethical Hacker. These are like the Jedi of the hacking world. And so these folks use their powers for good in order to help make companies and people more secure with their data so that it can't be hacked by the dark side. 
right? And so all of these things, again, it really is just going to depend on how we use it and how we, we provide the, the oversight for the people who are designing all of these tools. Could it be used for both? Yes. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. This next question is a very important one to the many business leaders here in the audience and the students who will someday be business leaders. And it's about the, leading the workforces through this transformation ahead. What's your advice on being straight with a workforce about this rapid advancement of AI and the workplace transformations it's gonna drive, while at the same time being reassuring to that workforce that's gonna face that disruptive transformation? Uh, and I don't know how reassuring uh, one can be because the reality is this is coming whether people like it or not because you can see how fast we've uh, advanced with the internet and with technology just in the last 20 years, right? Think about what things were like for those of us who were around back in the 80s. You know, I remember when we, when we got our first VCR and the first movie I watched on it was The Black Hole. I don't know if you guys remember that movie. And so that was a huge day when you could pop that movie in and watch it at home. Now, I'm like, remember back when we used to buy physical DVDs? That was a thing, huh? You know, we have this huge collection of physical DVDs at our house that we don't even use anymore because now we have everything on iTunes and Netflix and all that stuff. And so if you think about how fast things have changed, it's, it's the same in the workplace. Think about how critical technology is to every business in here. And was it that critical t uh, 20 years ago? Maybe not so much, but it sure is today. And so the workforce has to adapt, just like the jobs of delivering food for room service is going to be taken over by robots. We need to make sure that all of our workforce is being trained to handle that transition. It's not that they took someone's job away, it's that the job has changed. And so we now need to change how we're educating the workforce, not just the young people, but the existing workforce so that they are suited to do these new jobs. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And another workforce question, from my perspective as a technologist who has hired technologists for a couple of decades. And uh, that, um, that is about the gender gap in technology. A research from a number of years ago showed that uh, the role models for technology tended to be geeky males and that that was one of the many factors at play with the, the gender gap. Uh, what are the other key factors? Is that a factor? and how quickly will those uh, gender gap factors close in technology? So I don't think that the, the nerdy male stigma is so much a thing anymore. You know, I think, um, you know, geeks run the world, quite honestly. That's what I, I always told my kids. Be nice to the geeks, you'll probably work for one of them someday. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, the geeks actually have all the power because they have all the knowledge. You know, knowledge is power. And so uh, I'm a geek and very proud of it, and I have been for quite a long time. And when I first started in the industry back in the early 90s and the early dot-com days, uh, I went and got my Cisco, Microsoft, Novell, A-plus certifications and was hired a couple days after I got all of those by a woman who wanted to give other women a chance to get into technology, because back in the early dot-com days, there, there were almost none. And so this was in Southern California. She mentored me for a couple months, and then she left to go to a new job, and she was replaced by a man who instantly decided that as a woman, I had no business being there. That women did not uh, become engineers, that women should just not do that. They should do homemaking type things, and cook, and clean, and all that stuff. Neither of which I do. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, so he decided to try to make me quit, and so he would give me assignments in Compton and Inglewood and Watts and some of the most gang-ridden areas of Los Angeles. So here I am, this little white girl driving a big white van around downtown LA full of millions of dollars of technology equipment, doing Y2K upgrades in the middle of the night next to crack houses, and I always said, wow, you know what, I might get shot, but I'm, he, he's not going to make me quit. And so I would, add, and he would give me assignments that were way over my head, way out of my scope of expertise. And so I would grab any of the other engineers and say, hey, show me how to do this. Show me how this works. Show me how I configure this router. And for every one person I had that was a stumbling block in my path, there were 10 that wanted to help me. You know, and so I always say look for the helpers because they are there. Uh, but so as far as getting more women into technology, a lot of that starts at home and in the classroom from an elementary age. And so if we are not encouraging our daughters and minorities to go into technology, it's not going to happen. They might be encouraged at school, but if they don't have the support at home, it's, it's probably not going to go far. 
And so uh, in Las Vegas, for instance, we have a very large Hispanic population. And for a lot of those kids, the American dream is not a thing for them. There's no money for them to go to school. Maybe their parents still aren't legal in this country. And so their primary goal is, you know, well, maybe I can go work in housekeeping at the Tropicana, or maybe I can go work in fast food, or something to that effect. And so if you can point them to these career paths, uh, like at College of Southern Nevada, for instance, they have a fantastic certification program. So kids can go there and become certified in Cisco, Microsoft, VMware in just about two years and maybe pay $3,000 total and be instantly employable in a field that cannot possibly find enough talented uh, applicants for the jobs without having leveraged all the debt. And so they can instantly be employable in this amazing career path and be scot-free from a debt perspective. And so the certification path for tech is awesome because you don't have to have a four-year degree to go into technology. I still don't have a four-year degree. My mother would very much like for me to go back and get one. I'm like, well, I'm a little busy, you know? <laughs> I think I'm okay right now. I'll go get a you know, nice degree for you though, mom. Um, but so, so it's, it's a very critical thing that we, are in, that we have to be encouraging all, all of our daughters and minorities to go into this field. When I go and speak at tech events, I'm typically one of the only uh, um, women on the stage and in the room, and the room is just predominantly white males. And so I used to just talk about getting more women into it, but it's really everybody. You know, how do we encourage people from every single race and gender background to go into these fields that need them? And they can do it. STEAM fields are totally not, it doesn't matter what color you are, what age you are, what gender you are, none of that stuff matters. And so we should all be encouraging every kid that we know to go into these fields because it's just a fantastic career path. And the great thing is a lot of these kids are gonna have jobs that haven't even been invented yet. Right, that's how fast all of this is changing. So they don't have to pick right now what they're gonna do for the next 50 years. Pick something to do today and then see where it takes you. Great, thank you for those terrific insights. And now we have time left for a couple of audience oh. questions. Yes. That right here. Where does net neutrality fit into all of this with all the communication going on? Net neutrality is a fascinating and frustrating topic, you know, where really um, some of the carriers would really like to be able to charge you more for uh, visiting certain sites more than others. And a lot of people think the internet should always be free no matter what. And the carriers are saying, well, how can it be free when we have to pay for that? You know, we have to pay for all of that physical infrastructure. And so net neutrality is a very controversial topic depending on who you're talking to. And of course, California just passed that law. And so we're going to see, though, uh, I think net neutrality is going to be in and be out and be in and be out. Depending on which politician gets into office, I think it's going to continually change. And I don't think we're, we're going to get locked into anything here for a while. How much should we value uh, You should value privacy a lot, but you shouldn't expect a ton of it if you use social media. So that's about the best thing I can tell you. Privacy is, you know, my husband, uh, for instance, does not like Alexa. I think Alexa is awesome. I can just verbally tell her what I want, and it miraculously shows up at my house. It's an, it's an awesome tool. My husband thinks Alexa is a spy. <laughs> and he's probably not wrong. So when he's home, I keep Alexa unplugged. And then when he goes out, I plug her back in. So I have a secret relationship going on with Alexa. <laughs> but privacy is really something that is managed by you with your own personal choices as to how much you put out there. How much do you put online? But it's only, you're only, you can only control it to such an extent because if you drive a car, if you go to the doctor's office, if you use a bank, there's a lot of organizations out there that have online information about you. And if you're using any kind of a bank at all, it could be hacked. If you're buying anything online, that could be hacked. You know, so yes, you should value your privacy tremendously, but there's only so much control over you have over that at this point. And so I, I also counsel all the kids that I speak to is beware of what you put on social media. Whatever's on your resume better exactly line up with what you look like on social media because you, we, we talk about your digital persona. It's sort of like if you guys ever saw the movie The Matrix. You know, in The Matrix, it was your online uh, revelation of your digital self. Well, your digital self had better be an upstanding citizen if you want to get a job. Because anybody that, that applies for a job on my team, we do all kinds of background checking on them on social media. And we go back years to see what kind of a person are they? What are they willing to put out there for the world to see? What have they been doing with their lives? So, so people, a lot of the young kids get a little crazy with social media. I've told all my kids, 
that if you do anything on social media that I don't like, and I promise you I will see it, because I promise you I will always know more about this than you. <laughs> I will have your, your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat accounts all shut down and your friends too. And my husband said, can you really do that? I said, I don't know, but they think I can. So <laughs> parenting is 90% smoke and mirrors sometimes, you guys know. What's after cloud? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I don't know that anything's after cloud. I think cloud is just going to continue to involve. Cloud's not gonna stop. Uh, the fact that we can keep all of our music and our movies in iTunes, that's a cloud. The fact that you guys use online banking, you did not have to buy special software and computers in order to do the online banking. You just log into the website and, and the bank has taken care of all of that. They made a very easy interface and then your data lives on their cloud. And so that's, that's really just gonna continue on and, and become more and more a part of our lives. So yeah, it's not gonna end. Oh, I look forward to that day. <laughs> Right, I would really love a scandal-free politics, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, no, you're gonna see, um, here's the thing, so, oh boy, that's a loaded topic. The egos of the people who tend to get elected is probably not going to allow, they're probably not gonna allow themselves to be replaced by robots anytime soon. Uh, that's again our, our humanity um, controlling that, that atmosphere, right? Because we all have our opinions, and AI really only has the opinions we tell it to have. And so AI can be used behind the scenes, though, to manipulate votes, as we've all seen uh, to our dismay. So uh, that, that is a, um, it's, the politicians are not going to be replaced by AI anytime soon. I don't think any of us are gonna wanna necessarily give up control of the government to, um, you know, really it's gonna become the matrix and our robot overlords will rule us all, and so I don't think any of us want that. But uh, yeah, I think you'll see a lot more of it behind the scenes used to manipulate human emotion towards the votes, for sure. Um, with changing technology, do you see data storage changing dramatically in the future? And as a tech company like Switch, um, how do you prepare for that strategically? Uh, we have to keep building data centers. And uh, our company has over 500 patented inventions that were all invented by our CEO and founder, Rob Roy, that have made our facilities uh, the highest density facilities in the world, meaning you can pack and run more computers in there by 50 to 60 times any other data centers in the world. So it's really about cramming more technology into a smaller space. Like if you look at your iPhone, how much technology is in there. And remember back in the day, I don't know if you guys remember the brick, phone, you know, and it, it only had like maybe, you know, one kilobyte of data on it. And now we're up to like 256 gigabytes of data on a phone that's smaller than the brick. And so how do you pack more technology into a smaller space? And so the need for data centers is not going to go away because the need for data is not going to go away and the data all has to live somewhere. And so that's really, it's about building that physical infrastructure with the power and the cooling and the connectivity and the physical security to keep it all safe that, that's really going to be required to run all of that as we go forward. Moore's Law is still valid, and what should we be teaching that we're not teaching? Moore's Law is sort of still valid. There's a couple of companies out there that have given up on Moore's Law because the cost to continually drive those numbers down has become so massive that customers can't pay for what some of these companies are creating. And so there's been a few well-documented cases out there uh, uh, that have, um, Symer being one of them is a Swedish company, that have said, okay, we're done with Moore's Law because it, it's gotten to a, a co the cost does not, out, does not, it's outweighing the benefits. So um, some companies though are still driving that. I mean, we're getting down to, you know, seven nanometer chips uh, using a, a laser that can actually just photograph the image of all the circuitry onto the processor. It's really fantastic. Uh, and so what should you be teaching that you're not teaching? I'm not sure what you are teaching, so I can't necessarily speak to that. But I would say every uh, college and university out there needs to figure out how to integrate certification programs into its uh, curriculum because that's a lot of the future and coding programs. Uh, you know, there's so many different types of code out there, but are we teaching our kids how to speak the language of the machines? It's very important, you know, and when, I, when we teach coding in Las Vegas, uh, all the kids who are bilingual have a leg up because they've already learned two languages. Coding is really just learning the language of the computer. And so it's really not that hard, anyone can do it. But so I would say coding and certification programs are, are key to the future of, of education. Sure. BMP. <laughs> yep. What's the question? <laughs> what are we gonna do about it? Nothing. There's nothing you can do about it. 
Electromagnetic pulse shuts down machines. So if you have a Faraday cage, you might be shielded against it, but it's all theoretical. An EMP is an electromagnetic pulse, and so an electromagnetic pulse can basically wipes out all the electricity in any device, and so it shuts machines off. And so uh, EMPs can be caused by solar flares. Uh, they can also be caused by enemies who want to attack us. And so if you're not inside of a massive Faraday cage, you're not shielded. But a Faraday cage is only a shield up to a certain point. You know, if the sun has a massive solar flare that EMPs the entire planet, sorry, everything's off. <laughs> yeah, there's not much you can do about that. So um, our buildings are constructed as giant Faraday cages, but it's all theoretical, you know, because we can't test it. None of our clients want us to test that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes? So the, uh, someone asked about what's after the cloud. I'm more interested in what's after digital, right? When you look at the music industry and you've gone from analog to digital and some people now want to go back and, and hear the fullness and the richness, uh, digital implies a huge crunch of, of uh, work right, to take something that we all see and know and turn it into bits and bytes. Well, what's after digital? What's the next iteration of that? And, and what would that do to your business and everybody else, right? When does digital go back to analog? And what does that look like? Yeah, it's not going to go back to analog anytime soon. And some people really like the vinyl records. I'm not one of them. I think it sounds better digital, but that's just me. Uh, so. There's not really going to be any transfer back to analog simply because analog doesn't have the capability of just the speed and the, the massive capacity for data that digital does. And so digital is just going to, it, it, like with the augment of 5G connectivity, it's just going to get more and more and more and more. And so digital really is just bits and bytes. It's either a zero or a one. It's the presence or the absence of electricity. That's really all your computer can read. It, it, you know, when you really drill down into it, it's the presence or absence of electricity, zero or a one. And so until we create some new technology that, that is better than that, and I don't know what that is, I haven't heard of anything on the horizon, it's going to just continue to be an expansion of digital capacity. We have time for one last question. I think it looks like this from here where we are to where we're going. Because if you look at the exponential increase of the use of data, look at 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, now, today, how much our lives have changed. There is gonna continue to be an exponential increase in the use of data and statistics. You might not necessarily use them in your daily lives, but you know, just as an example, have any of you guys go to NASCAR? I love NASCAR, okay? We sponsor a driver, and I, I didn't really love NASCAR. Actually, I, I would tell you, I, there's the last place I would, you would find me would be at the track, but when we started to sponsor a driver, I, I got to spend time behind the scenes with the pit crew and in the inside the track where all of these massive two and three million dollar motor coaches are that belong to all of the racing teams, and you go inside these, ra these, these motor coaches, it's like NASA in there. They have all these people with computers and data, and they're, they're live analyzing all the stats that are coming off the drivers and the cars and the tires and the exhaust and the gas and all this stuff, and because they're trying to make sure that they're building the best machine and they're analyzing it in real time. And it's just fascinating how much data they're using. So a couple weeks ago, I went on a tour of um, Barrick Mining's, one of their gold mines up in northern Nevada. And so we went 2,700 feet down under the surface of the earth, which is more than two Empire State Buildings down. And so it took a really long time for the elevator to get all the way down to the bottom. And then we got in these open air trucks and we drove down, 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 and it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And we get to this guy who's drilling this huge, massive drill with all of these robotic arms on it and stuff, and the robot can change all the drill bits out. But the, the drill is connected to a laser that's pointing into the, the thread of where he's supposed to drill in the rock, and it's connected back to his iPad in the, in the cabin of, the, of this drill. And I, and I said, Wait, tell me how this works. He said, well, we, they, the surveyors have already mapped out where the, where the threads are and where the dust is, and so I'm drilling using the laser pointer that's guided by my iPad. This is 2,700 feet below the surface of the Earth. And so the mine, this particular mine, they, uh, out of every one ton of, of ore and rock they bring up, they get half an ounce of gold dust. But they bring up 3,000 tons of ore every day. And so think about all the data that they're using to make sure that they're getting their most bang for the buck with this work and keeping all of the, the miners that are 2,700 feet below the surface of the earth safe. And so 
the stats are very helpful. They're very valuable to these companies as they do things that we can't even imagine. I mean, think about eBay with all of their data. I mean, did any of you know that eBay never deleted anything? It's very valuable to them. So yeah, none of that is, there's not gonna be a point at which we say, okay, it's not fun anymore. It's not about whether or not it's fun. Follow the money. Does it make them money? Great. Well, Missy, we so appreciate your participation in the perspectives you've shared. I think the last question was a, a great takeaway for everybody steering a business or advancing their careers to contribute to business that the, the future looks like this mm -hmm. with the upward slope. So thank you for your time Thanks, today. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now Okay. And now Dean Lawson will offer some closing remarks. In appreciation, we have something for you that really isn't for you, so I will read what it is. Okay. Uh, the Seidman College of Business, on behalf of the Peter F. Secchia Breakfast Lecture Series, is sponsoring a hydrate biosand water filter in your name oh. with Pure Water for the World in Honduras, an outreach hosted by Cascade Engineering Native Energy, which is a local company. That is really cool. So this is for you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. That is wonderful. Time. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs>